Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. All right. Had a little bit of sound issue last week. I want to welcome you this morning. It is, of course, the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. We're in the middle now of our Trinity message series. Today we're going to be focusing on God or as the Son. But I first want to draw your attention to some of the announcements that are on the back. It is summertime, which means it's a very small list, so it won't take very long. We have coming up on July the 4th. Yes, it's not a typo. I've had people ask me that. It is going on because, well, there aren't many fireworks at 9.30 in the morning. So Ladies Coffee and Conversation, Thursday, July the 4th, 9.30, hosted at St. James in Coburn. And, of course, all ladies in the area, whether involved with church or not, are invited to come out and just have some fun. I did want to make sure that you were aware this is a little bit of a typo. July 11th through the 18th, it's actually through the 14th, um, I will be out of state. So it's July 11th through the 14th. We're helping Marissa to move. So I will be available by phone. I'm just making you aware that I won't be in town. So if you have an issue, please just pick up the phone and call. Um, also, a reminder that our next trustees and ad board meeting is July 15th at 7 p.m., and everyone is welcome to attend that. And at the end of July, we have our charge-wide three churches connected uh, worship and picnic, and we're going to be doing that in tandem with Fellowship Bible Church. Uh, we're going to do this at the Steigers Grounds, which is behind the Fellowship Church on Lower Georges Valley Road. The service starts at 1030. We encourage you to bring a lawn chair for that. And if you'd like to stay for the potluck lunch, just bring a dish to share if you would like. And uh, meet beverages and table service are going to be provided by Fellowship Church. They're that excited that they don't have to do anything that day but show up. So gratitude is a good thing. You'll also see that there's an order form to sponsor a butterfly for the butterfly release for that worship service in honor or memory of a loved one. Uh, we need those in by July 15th, both the orders and the payment. If you know someone who uh, is interested in doing this but they say they can't come to the service, you can still sponsor a butterfly even if you cannot be there that day if it's meaningful to you. And then you can just go to the grounds and maybe you'll see your butterfly. Uh, but please, the more the, the merrier and anyone and everyone is welcome to that. Are there any other announcements to share this morning? Seeing none, I want to draw your attention to our centering words. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is the wisdom and the word of God, as well as the way to God. Please rise in body or spirit as we prepare our hearts for worship by singing together the sanctuary song. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. Thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Please join me now in the call to worship. How shall we describe the concept of Trinity? In the second person, we discover Jesus the Redeemer. There are so many ways to describe the work and witness of God. Let us continue now with the opening prayer. Spirit of wisdom and hope, we witness your glory in the heavens and hear your call to us. We are sometimes overwhelmed by the thought of your compassionate care. Open our hearts this day to hear and respond in joy to your call, that we may serve you faithfully all our days. Amen. Please turn in the hymnal to number 85 to sing together, We Believe in One True God. We believe in one true God, Father, 
Son and Holy Ghost, ever present help in need. Praise my all the heavenly host, by whose mighty power alone all is made and wrought and done. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, who descended from his throne and more a salvation won by whose cross and death are we rescued from sin's misery we confess the holy ghost who from both for air proceeds who upholds and comforts us in all trials fears and needs Blessed and holy Trinity, praise forever be to thee. God's boundless generosity transcends the limits of the world. And it also nudges us to fill our land with blessing. Through our energy, our time, and our talents, we usher God's peace into a world that's filled with storms and filled with obstacles. Peace on God's terms, not human terms, looks and feels a little different. Let us prepare to bless the gifts by first singing together the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Generous God, as we bring and bless the offerings before you in this wonderful post-Pentecost season, we acknowledge the gift of your grace, freely given and yet calling us to respond. Help us not to accept your grace in vain, but to let it bear fruit in our lives and also in our communities. May our actions reflect the transforming power of your grace as we open our hearts to love, to vulnerability, and to relationship, trusting in the abundance of your grace to guide us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. There are many things that we do hold in confidence, whether they're things that we hold because we just don't feel like we have the agency to share it for ourselves or for someone else, which is why we go to God in silent prayer first, and then we all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sound of the birds sweetly singing in the trees. We thank you for the cool of the morning, the promise of rain, for the green grass, the abundant gardens. Lord of mysteries, we also admit that sometimes we're very confused by the concept of a Trinitarian God, the Trinity. We can speak the words of three and one, but our minds can sometimes be boggled and confused. How can three be one and one be three? You are so great, so expansive, and your work is so awesome that we try to find ways to express your work and witness in our lives and ways we can understand. Help us to understand it's okay not to fully understand. From before the beginning of time, you offered love and creative wisdom as you created all that is. In the person and ministry of Jesus, you taught us more clearly about your nature and love, and you gave to us ways that we should live peacefully together on your terms, not our own. 
The Holy Spirit is offered as our guardian and our guide, faithfully with us all our days. Full and complete is your love for us, your creation. We know you are faithful to all we have prayed for. So help us again to be more faithful to you. Give us opportunities to witness and serve on your terms. Heal and restore us. Because you call us to be people of prayer, we will now share the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I would ask you to please remain seated for our hymn of preparation. We're going to prepare for the word and the word proclaimed by singing together number 64, Holy, Holy, Holy. way to start into our first reading. Of course, we're going to begin our reading today in the book of John chapter 14, and I'm going to be reading verses 8 through 21. Now again, this week I'll be using the message for this because as always, I encourage you to read these passages in your own Bible later on, but these are passages we read so often. It can be helpful to hear an in other words version, and so hear these words from the message paraphrased by Eugene Peterson. Philip said, Master, show us the Father, then we'll be content. You've been with me all this time, Philip, and you still don't understand. To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you aren't mere words. I don't just make them up on my own. The Father who resides in me crafts each word into a divine act. Believe me, I am in my Father and my Father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see, these works. 
The person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, but even greater things, because I am on my way to the Father. I'm going to break there. Jesus is going to return to the Father, therefore the works that he is going to do while he's on earth will cease, and now they will take over and do those same works over and over and over in greater number. And I'll continue. Because I am on my way to the Father, I am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. From now on, whatever you request along the lines of who I am and what I am doing, I'll do it. That's how the Father will be seen for who he is in the Son. I mean it. Whatever you request in this way, I'll do. If you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. I will talk to the Father and he'll provide you another friend so that you will always have someone with you. This friend is the spirit of truth. The godless world can't take him in because it doesn't have eyes to see him, doesn't know what to look for. But you know him already because he has been staying with you and will even be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I'm coming back. In just a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you're going to see me because I am alive and you're about to come alive. At that moment, you will know absolutely that I'm in my Father and you're in me and I'm in you. The person who knows my commandments and keeps them, that's who loves me. And the person who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and make myself plain to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The message today is God as the Son. Now, our one true God offers three expressions, and they are provision, sacrifice, and proximity. These are things that might even speak to us. We can understand how we can be three things in one, right? And we can understand how we can be a, a husband, a father, a brother, a son. We can be all these different expressions. They're not the same thing, are they? But God the Father in three distinct expressions of provision, sacrifice, and proximity are what we're working through. Last week, we talked about God as Father, the provision, the provider including providing the other two expressions. We consider the Trinitarian nature of God as expressed in the form of the Father, but a Father that we might have in some ways experienced a little in this life, but many have never experienced in full this side of heaven. But this Father is still available to us all. This Father who provides, corrects, and refines, and protects, always having our best interests, and not only individually, but communally as well. The next expression of the Trinity, God the Son, is the earthly representation of God, because he is God. Where you see Jesus, you see God. And one of my favorite things to do at a gathering with a lot of generations, a lot of kids running around, is figuring out which kid belongs to which family. Who do, who do you belong to? I always remember being asked that as a little kid. I never knew what that meant. Who do you belong to? Never made sense to me when I was a child, and so I have to watch myself when I try to do the same thing to them. But, you know, some so strongly represent or resemble, rather, their parents or another family member, or they remind me of their grandmother, and it, it could be whether it's by looks or by their traits or what they go for on the buffet table. Their features or mentalities or preferences resemble their family, and that can be true whether it's family by blood or by bond. Nurture's very strong. And I get this myself because I am what people call the spit and image of my mother. So much so that when I would go to the grocery store, it's still today, I will have people approach me my mother's age and say, you must be Dottie's daughter. 
you look exactly like her. I had two comments on Facebook just last week from pictures that my sister posted from Mother's Day of my mother holding her when she was very small, and they said, that's Teresa. It's like, nope, that's my mom. And we, we've always looked alike. When, when we look at pictures of us, because you know, I'm really old. I was born way back in the 1900s and the mid-1900s. So you know, my earliest pictures were black and white. She took pictures with a brownie camera and a lot of them were black and white. And so when you looked at pictures of us, especially the formal pictures, when we're about three or four years old, we are identical. And the only way that you can tell us apart is she has blue eyes and I have brown eyes. And there were times she and I would look at the photos when I was in my 30s and we were like, the only way we can tell is looking at the eyes. And I have a younger sister, Nedra, a much, much younger sister, Nedra, she would tell you. And she is mistaken for me. She loves that. In fact, the older I get, the more she enjoys that. You know what I'm saying? So she's had people come up to her and have a full-on conversation with her, thinking that they know who she is, and these are people my mother's age, till it gets to the point where they'll say something like, well, so how's the ministry going, Teresa? And she'll have to say, oh, I'm not her. <laughs> so we're not quite as close in resemblance as me and my mother, but you know what it's like to have a very strong resemblance. The thing is, my mother and I are not very much alike. There are things that, that we just, characteristics, traits, we look alike. But the packages are not exactly the same. This is what they're talking about in that passage that we heard. You know, show us the package of the Father and then we'll understand. And Jesus is trying to say, you are seeing it. It's kind of a reverse. Seeing me is maybe seeing the resemblance of my mother, but it's not necessarily seeing all the wonderful nuances that were her. But Jesus is every single wonderful nuance of his Father God. So the first point is the Son shows us the Father. We read this in the Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah is called the Prince of Peace, and that title would infer what? That there is a King of Peace. And when his disciples lived, the world was full of war and slavery and poverty. Uncertainty was rampant, and yet Jesus said, my peace, that peace of the King of Peace, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you? Don't let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful, John 14, 27. His words didn't make a lot of sense to one who is 100% human context driven. Because when Jesus is saying my peace, they want it to mirror their peace. But my, my peace and Jesus, my peace are very different. How can we have peace when crime, rebellion, dishonesty, and greed are all around us? Don't we have people saying that yet today? How is that possible? The world tells us it's impossible. You can't have peace. And Jesus told them that they were going to experience tribulation, rejection, and death, and yet they could have peace. The Prince of Peace was sent by the King of Peace to offer substitutionary death. And at this point, they didn't even know all the details about that yet. But before we can have or know the peace of Christ, we've got to have peace with God. Reconciliation with the Father required payment for our sin debt in full on behalf of sinful mankind through that sacrificial death on the cross. It was on God's terms. And why was this necessary? Because the sinfulness of mankind, humankind, prohibited them from having any direct contact with God's perfection and holy nature. Our sin does the same for us, so God provided a way. God provided the Son to perform important work, world-changing work of showing and telling what God is like. I loved show and tell when I was small. Anybody ever like show and tell? I loved show and tell because you got to bring your stuff, stuff that mom would otherwise never allow you to take to school. 
And I loved it. Sometimes I'd bring a toy, usually it was a toy. Sometimes a favorite article of clothing, maybe a hat. I know I took a rabbit's foot one time because I lost it at recess. <laughs> but I remember it was so special because it was sharing something with the class that both figuratively and literally were where I came from. It was how we learned what we could not otherwise see about each other, things that we didn't talk about in school. The sun is God's way of showing the world his love, grace, and mercy. And Jesus showed us the nature of the Father. He told us about the Father's plan to rescue the world through himself. So just like I was so proud to show and tell, God was proud of the work his son had come to accomplish. In fact, we heard it a couple of times in scripture. God said that he was proud of his son. In the fact, the book of Hebrews speaks to this. This is Hebrews 1, verse 3, reading out of the New American Standard Bible, which is a word-for-word -word translation of the original language. And his, Jesus, he is the radiance of his glory, God, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Through Christ's actions, we do learn something very important. I've shared with you before that there are different preachers and churches where they are taught that they can become Jesus. They can become God. And yet we never hear of anyone else who sits down at the right hand of the majesty on high, which is the place of a son. So through Christ's actions, we see the kindness of God. And through Christ's service, we see the love of God. And through Christ's life, we see the justice of God. Through Christ's interactions, we see the mercy of God. And this is because of what is so beautifully illustrated by an evangelist, a uh, late evangelist named S.D. Gordon. He put it this way, Jesus was God spelling himself out in language humanity could understand. Which brings us to our second point, which is God the Son came to dwell among us. Humanity is limited in its ability to perceive and receive the divine. And it's because we are not divine. As I said before, we don't become gods. We did not come here as gods. There are people who make that claim. We are 100% human, whereas Jesus was both 100% human and 100% divine. We know Jesus that way now. But I believe his disciples might have discerned Jesus to be 50-50. The reason I say that is I believe that part of the time they saw Jesus very much like themselves, very human. And I believe other times he would speak in ways they couldn't understand, he would make decisions they really didn't understand, and he would do things that just blew them away. These are things we just don't do. And in those moments, I think they saw him as divine. So part of the time he was human to them, part of the time he was, he was divine to them. And so I think that they had a 50-50 understanding. And partly because they really couldn't wrap their heads around it. Why? According to the Bible, there's a great chasm, a great gap between us and God because of our sin, but also because God is without bodily form and we struggle with things that are unseen. In fact, we say it. We'll say, I just can't see that. <laughs> I just can't see that in him. I can't see him doing that. Right? We struggle with things that are unseen. So Jesus serves as a material expression of an immaterial God. And the gospel speaks of this in John chapter 1, verse 14. Again, reading from the New American Standard Bible. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory of God, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So word is capitalized because it's referring to a person. Jesus is called the word because he perfectly lived out all the things that had been said in those days 
both shared orally by those who memorized it word for word before it was even written down, what we call the Old Testament. And very important to remember that Jesus lived out the Old Testament. Now, he walked out the Old Testament written about God. God's intentions for the world and the ways he longs for his creation to function were demonstrated, corrected. The things that had somehow gone wrong side up, Jesus was able to then bring right side up to bring newer understanding through the person of Jesus Christ. So John wrote to describe the incarnation of God, how God put on, the Latin word is carna, flesh to exist in the form of human in order to make his dwelling with us. He dwelt among us, not above us. He was with us in everyday common fashion. He blended in, he did not stand above. He blended in in the sense that there is no description of him because there was nothing especially important about the way he looked. Wouldn't you think if there was, they would have mentioned it. And this itself was sacrifice, just coming in this way, because Jesus gave up heaven to come to earth to give his earthly life. The one which he takes, he gives up. And this was all that people on earth thought they had was life. It's through his life, death, and resurrection that we get a glimpse of God's glory and a picture of the Father. And we struggle with that, I think, on Good Friday. We struggle with that parts of Holy Week too. But remember, we need to know God on God's terms and that's really a week when we are learning about God on God's terms. And those terms are based on truth and grace. It's so huge, it's hard for us to understand. God, grace is God's unmerited favor, and truth is God's way of living. And C.S. Lewis describes this beautifully, the incarnation of Jesus through the lens of a family pet. This is one of my favorite writings that he wrote. And it's this, lying at your feet is your dog. Imagine for the moment that your dog and every dog is in deep distress. Some of us love dogs very much. If it would help all the dogs in the world become like men, would you be willing to become a dog? Would you put down your human nature, leave your loved ones, your job, your hobbies, art, literature, and music, and choose instead of the intimate communion with your beloved, the poor substitute of looking into the beloved's face and wagging your tail, unable to speak or smile? Christ, by becoming man, limited the most precious thing in the world to him, his unhampered, unhindered communion with the Father. Jesus came to dwell with us as a human because of the great distress humankind was in due to the brokenness and the devastation of sin. Jesus limited his divine self by leaving the splendor of heaven and unhampered communion, what I like to call leaving behind his divine wallet, so that we would have the opportunity to commune with God in terms and ways we could understand and embrace before we would dig into the things that were a little harder and a little harder and a little harder. And if you've ever wondered if God loves you, the Trinity reminds you that God loves you very much because he sent his son to save you and me, to make you new. And Jesus opens the door to a restored family relationship with God. You can't be Jesus, but you can be God's son. You could be God's daughter. The last point is Jesus is the way to life in God. So a great way to understand Jesus as the Son is just to read the words that Jesus spoke about himself. In the book of John, we get a very clear picture of Jesus' role within the Trinity as Jesus was coming to the end of his earthly ministry. His life was going to end soon, and he needed to find ways because he's learned over time that, you know, Peter responds very He's a big personality. He's hot and cold. He responds very big. So he tries to temper what he says at this point in his ministry. 
He wants to encourage the disciples. He told them he would be leaving as he foreshadows his death. But they are so used to him sending them on ahead and he catches up with them or he goes on ahead and they catch up with him that they simply ask where he's going. And here's what he said. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now, sometimes when I'm highlighting in my Bible, I do things like this. I will dig out the other message that's within there if you pull out the extra words. It's, I think it might be partly the editor in me. But I find it interesting. You could kind of boil down what Jesus says in a very direct fashion. I am the way, the truth, the life. Come to the Father through me. Pretty simple. Of course, the original language is Greek. They have fewer, far fewer words in Greek than we do in the English language. We've got to kind of fill in the gaps. So the order is going to be exactly what, what would appear in the Greek. But I also think it's important to note, no one comes to the Father but through me. So interesting. Jesus sums up his three-part statement by saying the only way to the Father is through himself. So when Jesus went to the cross and was crucified for our sins account, he took sin and the penalty of death with him. So he took both the debt and the penalty, canceling our debt because giving his life on account of our sin closed that book. Now, the disciple who may have thought him to be 50-50, of course, found Jesus 100% human on Good Friday when he died. And they understood him as 100% divine Resurrection Sunday being raised by God the Father. And it's interesting, we talk about God raising him up. God raised his son. And we raise our children. Sometimes we help raise other children. Where are we raising them to? We can know the way to the Father because we can know Jesus and not just be acquainted with him, but know him. Not just his name, not just where he lives, but know his nature. Today's world is filled with people who are seeking a way to get to God on their own terms. But God's terms are set. It's a little bit like going to a bank and telling them, I know that we have a contract for this loan for my car, but here's what I'm going to do for you. It just doesn't work. God's terms are set and found only in the blood of Jesus and his precious name. Jesus is the only way to heaven. John Dyer, a Welsh poet and pastor in the 1700s, wrote this. A man may go to heaven without health, without riches, without honors, without learning, without friends, but he can never go there without Christ. You know, it's possible to make our own, it is possible to think we can make our own way to God, but to think that you can make your own way is proof to me you have not read the Bible. Or if you have delved into the Bible, you've allowed someone else to tell you what it says. And you haven't allowed God to speak to you through those words directly. So much of history is about what happened when everyday people got the Bible and could understand it. Because they were able to figure out what was being preached at the pulpit that was not in there. And what was. Putting our faith in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and allowing the Holy Spirit to remind us of all that Jesus taught and really to lead us in our lives today on God's terms is the way to life in God. I want to close the message now with a word of prayer. Dear God, we come before you humbly recognizing we are sinners in need of your forgiveness and salvation. We believe with all our heart that Jesus Christ is your son who came to this world to save us from our sins. We acknowledge that Jesus lived a perfect and blameless life, that Jesus died on a cross and rose again on the third day, conquering sin and death. 
We confess that we are sinners asking for your mercy and forgiveness. And we repent of our sins and turn away from a life of disobedience, inviting you, Jesus, to come into our hearts and be the Lord and Savior of our lives. We surrender all that we are to you. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and grace. We receive your forgiveness. We receive the free gift of eternal life. And it is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. In the Trinity, we find love and correction from God the Father. We find grace and restoration from God the Son. And next week, we're going to find guidance and direction, proximity, from God in the form of the Holy Spirit. Please rise now for our closing hymn, which is number 156, I Love to Tell the Story. <laughs> to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems, than all the golden fancies of all our golden the back there, there are discussion questions, things that you can think about for meditation purposes. There are questions that you can think about. There's one for each day of the week, Monday through Friday. You can look at those and do with them as you wish. Go in peace, dear ones, and go with the knowledge that God the Father, our parent, Jesus, God's Son, and the Holy Spirit are with you. Bring peace to all you meet. Go now and know that God goes with you. Amen. Thank you.